Good to see y'all tonight. Good to be back. Uh, my dad and I had a good trip to Norman, Oklahoma. Uh, we did not have a successful football game, but that's all right. That's all right. Uh, we had a good time. Uh, you know, Oklahoma, I'd never really been to Oklahoma. We, I've been through there once or twice, but uh, this is the first time I spent the night, and the people there were very nice. I'd, I'd heard that from others, that uh, OU fans are, are real gracious at the stadium, and they were. We heard a lot of welcome to Norman, and, uh, but uh, ate some good food. Uh, on, the way back, on the way there, we saw all these signs for fried pies. And, and so on the way back, it was the middle of the morning. I mean, we'd had this huge breakfast at the hotel, and Dad said, I think I want to try one of those fried pies. And I said, I do too. So we pulled into one of those places, and it's original fried pie company, and golly, that was pretty good. You know, I, I didn't really need lunch after that, but I ate it anyway. But I, I anyway, we enjoyed our trip. It was a nice straight drive, and, and uh, just don't, I need to treasure every moment I get. With, with my dad and, and my mom in the days to come. Uh, Carrie had my mom and, and they brought their other grandson, uh, my nephew. So she had that to contend with, but it turned out to be good. Uh, it, was, it was good, they, were, they had a good time. So some of y'all got to meet my mom, in fact, Sunday, and I appreciate that. So we're, we're in this Tough question series talking about how do we know that Jesus is who he said he was? How do we know that Jesus Claims about himself are true. Last week, we talked about how, in spite of the fact that there are hundreds, maybe even thousands of different religions in world history, it's logical to assume that only one is true. And in fact, it's very logical to say they can't all be right. They make, uh, they make contradictory claims to one another. There's no way they can all be right. And there's no way multiple ones can be right without... Uh, basically stripping those religions of everything that makes them unique. So we also saw how Jesus himself, no matter what you think of Jesus as a human being, and I think most people uh, would say they admire Jesus as a human being, they, you have to admit when you read his teachings that he thought he was God, that he believed that he was the only way to salvation, that his way was the only way. So to paraphrase C.S. Lewis, we said this last week, Jesus claims box you in. You, you have to say he's one of three things. He's either a liar, a con man of the worst sort, or he is a lunatic, the kind of person who thinks he's God but is not, or he is exactly what he said he was. The one thing he can't be is just a wise, godly, uh, gracious teacher. Wise, godly, gracious human beings do not say the kinds of things Jesus said. So how do we make that determination? Why should we believe that Jesus is Lord? Interestingly, Christianity is unique in several ways, but one of the ways it's unique is it's the only religion of all the major religions that hinges on the historicity of one event in time. Let me explain what I mean. If you are a Buddhist and someone proves to you behind, by, beyond a shadow of a doubt that there was never a person named Gautama the Buddha, you could still be a Buddhist. You could still follow the Noble Eightfold Path and do all the things that Buddhism teaches, and it, would, it wouldn't hurt your faith in the least. Uh, Muslims, on the other hand, they believe the, the events of the Quran actually happened, but those aren't essential to their faith. What, what's essential is that you follow the five pillars, that you do those five things Muhammad said that lead you to God, that give you salvation. So the history of the things in the Quran aren't really important. It's the teachings that matter. Same with Judaism. Uh, if, if you prove to a Jew there's no way that Moses parted the waters of the Red Sea, there's no way that there were all these uh, miracles, uh, these plagues in Egypt, there, those are just sort of colorful ways of explaining how the Jews found liberation uh, that Jewish person could still follow the law of Moses, could still believe there is one God named Yahweh, could still, uh, could still follow those laws and live the life of a faithful Jew. The historicity of those events doesn't really matter as long as he believes there's a God. But on the other hand, if you take away the resurrection of Jesus, there is no Christianity. If you take away the resurrection of Jesus, then we've got nothing left. Jesus did not say... My philosophy of life is the right way. Follow my philosophy and you'll get to God. No, he said, I am the way. 
and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. He didn't invite people to a new religion. He didn't say, follow my teachings. He said, follow me. Follow me. That was his consistent invitation. People had to get up and follow, physically follow a human being named Jesus, had to entrust their lives to him. Uh, some of you, if you've been here long enough, you've heard me quote Tim Keller quite a bit. Um, I've never actually met the man, but I, I admire his work, his, his writings, and his, his sermons. Uh, for many years, Keller was pastor of uh, Redeemer Presbyterian Church in Manhattan. He actually planted that church. And Manhattan, in the late 20th and the early 21st century, is a pretty unlikely place for evangelical Christianity to flourish, if you know anything about that part of the world. And yet, this church reached thousands of people and led to salvation, and now they're planting churches all around the world. But it was a typical thing for people in Manhattan to somehow get drawn into the orbit of Redeemer Presbyterian. And so a person who was uh, thoroughly secular, uh, Gentile, Jewish, didn't matter, uh, foreign, native, didn't matter, but someone who lived their whole life in Manhattan, who was, who was educated in a state university, who was sophisticated and, and highly educated and, and in no way accepted any of the tenets of Christianity, would somehow start visiting this church. And because the ministry of that church was so gracious and so genuine and so authentic, they would start to sort of change their mind a little bit. And so Keller got to have these conversations very often where someone would come up to him and say, listen, you know, I've been visiting here a while. Uh, a friend of mine, a guy at the law firm where I work or a person who I, who's in my theater troupe or whatever invited me. And, uh, you know, honestly, this isn't what I expected. Y'all are a lot saner than I thought Christians would be. And um, I, honestly, this is, this is really rather appealing to me. But I could never be a Christian. I just want you to know, I, I'll come here, but I can never be a Christian because... And it would always be something like, I could never be a Christian because it's so unscientific. And y'all believe the things that you believe about creation in the Bible. There's just no way that's true. I could never be a Christian. Or I, I, I like what I see of Jesus, but I could never be a Christian because your teachings about sexuality are so backwards and so primitive and so hateful, really, and narrow. I could never believe that. And Keller's response is very interesting. He wouldn't get into arguments and debates about that. He'd say, before we get into all of that, Let's start at the beginning. What do you believe about the resurrection? Do you believe Jesus rose from the dead three days after he died? And their, their, their response would usually be, well, I don't know. I, why does that matter? And he'd say, well, here's why it matters. Because if, if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, if you examine the evidence and you conclude that that was just a legend, it never happened, then there's really no reason to waste your time asking me these kinds of questions. I'm just a fool that's following a, a non-existent God uh, there's no answers here. But if Jesus did rise from the dead, if you examine the evidence and you conclude, yeah, I believe Jesus did rise from the dead, then he was exactly who he said he was. And therefore you can say, okay, I may not know all the answers. There may be some things in, in Christianity that still bother me, but I'm going to follow this man trusting that eventually those answers are going to come. And I think that's a good approach for us to take when we have friends, when we have neighbors, when we have coworkers, when we have relatives who want to debate with us about the teachings of Christianity, I'm not saying it's wrong to try to engage them on those issues, and we'll talk about some of those in weeks to come, but the key issue is, what do you believe about Jesus? Because if you reject Jesus, if you say he was just a man, then why are we even having this discussion? But if he was more than a man, then we, got, and then we have something to talk about. So, by the way, Tim Keller did not invent that argument. That's actually very biblical. It's 2,000 years old. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 14. 1 Corinthians 15, by the way, if, if uh, you're on a desert island and you can only have one chapter of the Bible, uh, this is a good candidate. I'm not saying this is the one. John 3 is a pretty good one. There's several others, but 1 Corinthians 15. Verse 14, he says, If Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain, and your faith is in vain. And then a few verses later in verse 17, he doubles down on that. If Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, and you are still in your sins. And that's just a breathtaking thing for Paul to say. So he's saying that thousands of years of tradition doctrines that people have died over, uh, 
hymns that have been written, people who've changed their lives, mission work done, churches built, all of it's a lie if Christ didn't rise. It all hinges on that one event and whether it actually happened or not. So why is that? Because if Christ didn't rise, then he was not telling the truth when he said he would. If Christ didn't rise, then he was just a human being. And Jesus claimed to be much more than that. So how do we know? How do we decide whether Christ really rose? So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you three proofs. Some of you have heard this. Some of you have heard this on an Easter Sunday or two or three. But many of you haven't. What are, what are some proofs that Christ really rose? Number one, the eyewitnesses. There is eyewitness testimony from the time of Christ that says that Jesus rose again. And we'll talk about why that's significant. When I say eyewitness testimony, Paul cites over 500 people in 1 Corinthians 15. He names some of them. Peter, the apostles, the Lord's brothers, and himself, Paul. But then he says at one point over 500 people, many of them still alive, saw Jesus risen. Now, why is this significant? See, one of the objections when you talk about the resurrection of Jesus, people say, how can you believe that when it's so obviously just a legend? We believe, there, there's all kinds of legends from the ancient world. Hercules supposedly killed a hydra, right? Odysseus fought against a, 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 a cyclops. None of us believe in that stuff. Why is the resurrection any different? Even in our own time, we have legends. I, I don't know how many of you are big baseball fans, but there's a, there's a story that during a World Series game 100 years ago, Babe Ruth, outfielder for the New York Yankees, stood at the plate and pointed to left field. And on the very next pitch, he hit the ball into the left field seats. And people will tell that story uh, as if it's true, but it's not. It never happened. There is no, there's literally no evidence it ever happened. So what probably happened was, over time, people just told that story about, boy, that's something the babe would do. Because he was, he was flamboyant, and he had no fear, and yeah, and then it became, he did it. And so people say, well, that's what happened with the resurrection. So what they say is, obviously, Jesus died, and his followers were sad, and they were trying to carry on his teachings, and they would say to one another, you know, isn't it like he's still with us? Doesn't it feel like he's still here? Don't you sometimes even almost hear his voice and feel his touch? And then over time, it got to be where they talk about, yeah, I remember three days after, I just had this sense that he was still with us. Generations would pass and that story would get passed down until so sooner or later it was not, I had this feeling he was still with us, but I saw him. Not I, but somebody hundreds of years before saw him. That's how legends develop. That's how legends become quote-unquote true. There's a problem with that, though. Legends take time to form. Babe Ruth was 100 years ago. Matthew, Mark, and Luke, at least those three of the four Gospels, were written by people who were alive at the time. John probably was, too but we know Matthew, Mark, and Luke were. And 1 Corinthians 15 that we've quoted from several times already that talks about the resurrection was written within 25 years at most of the time Jesus lived. Now, just to put that in some per, into some perspective, think about some events that happened in our world 25 years ago. And I'll throw out one that all of us will be familiar with. The O.J. Simpson trial was 25 years ago. Okay, remember that? Remember how that's all anybody wanted to talk about? That's all that was on the news. Those of you who watch soap operas were mad because you couldn't watch your soap operas because they had the trial on all day. And I know you're not going to admit you watch soap operas because you're in church, but some of you do. You can't miss your stories, right? So that was the big news for almost a year. And you and I don't remember all the details, hopefully. But if someone wrote a book today that said, the reason why, the real reason why O.J. Simpson was, was acquitted was the police found Nicole Brown Simpson and she was still alive. Would anybody believe that? No. Nobody would believe that because there are so many people still alive 
who saw her dead, so many people who were alive who knew who were either policemen or family members. Or, there's so many people who would say, how dare you say something like this? How dare you try to make money with such obvious falsehoods? If Paul would have written 1 Corinthians 15 and it had all been made up, it would have been shouted down. Within 25 years of the event, so many people would have said, who is this fool? And why is anybody reading his writings? No one could deny that the grave was empty. No one could deny that there were people walking around saying, I saw him alive. So again, to, to go back to Babe Ruth. So people today believe Babe Ruth pointed to the left field seats and then hit a home run. But in his own generation, they didn't. In fact, I, I saw an, an interview or I, I saw a documentary of the Ken Burns documentary about baseball which is worth your time. Um, they interview the, the pitcher who pitched to Babe Ruth on that at bat that supposedly he pointed to left field. And he said, if that big monkey would have pointed to left field, my next pitch would have been in his ear. <laughs> so legends take time to develop. They have to develop at a time when no one's alive to contradict them. And for my money, by the way, the most convincing eyewitness of all the eyewitnesses is Mary Magdalene. You know why? Because she was a woman. Not because I just trust women more than men, but because in the first century, in the ancient world, in virtually all cultures, don't, don't pick on the Jews because everybody was this way at that 2,000 years ago, women were seen as unreliable. If a woman witnessed a crime, her testimony was not considered valid unless her husband or another man corroborated it. Because the, the thinking went, well, you know, those women, they, they don't really get out of the house much. They don't really know what's, what the world is like. And, and they're a little hysterical and their emotions get the best of them. And so that's why in the Gospels, when Mary comes running back to the upper room and says, I have seen him, the Lord is alive, the disciples didn't believe her. They thought that what she was saying was foolishness. Let me ask you something. Why would the church make that up? If you were trying to create a story that said Jesus is risen, would you invent the detail that says the very first person to see him alive was a woman, and by the way, we didn't believe her? I mean, wouldn't you make up a story instead that said he appeared to all the disciples, or Peter at the very least? The church wouldn't make that up. It makes no sense to make it up. It's there because it happened that way. The eyewitnesses are one argument. Number two, there's the change in the apostles. So if you've never read the Bible, but you've got just a cursory knowledge of Christianity, you've never read the Bible, but you know there's someone named St. John and someone named St. Peter and St. Andrew, and you've seen schools named after these people, and you've seen cities named after them, and you've seen churches named after them, and you go into the scriptures thinking these are some pillars, right? And then you read the Gospels, and what do you find? You find some men who are cowardly, who are ignorant, who get in their own way, who who's trip over their own tongues, who constantly frustrate Jesus. He has to correct them. He has to at one point, sigh and say, uh, are you so dull? He literally says that in the Gospels. And then you read the four Gospels, you see these, these 12 men who you wouldn't trust to be the night manager of a Waffle House, right? And then you read Acts, and they're completely different. Suddenly they're courageous, they're bold, they're articulate, they're passionate, they're able to love their enemies. They're able to cross racial boundaries. They, they're able to change the world. What happened? How is that even possible? How did they become these men, as it says in Acts, who have turned the world upside down? And then think about Jesus' brothers. So the Gospels tell us Jesus had several brothers, and at least two of them became believers, James and Jude. Both wrote books of the New Testament. James actually became the leader of the Jerusalem church after Peter uh, let, moved on to do missionary work. And, and when you read the book of James and you read the book of Jude, both of them, they say things about Jesus that indicate these two brothers didn't just think he was a great religious leader. They believed he was divine. They called him Lord. Now, I have one brother, and I love my brother, and I'm very proud of my brother. 
Uh, he is an architect. Uh, if you go to my hometown of Yoakum, Texas, every school in that town has been designed by my brother. I'm really proud of that. All through that region, there are buildings that my brother's designed, libraries and school buildings and office buildings. And he's got skills that I can't even imagine. And he's got kids who are athletic and, and you know, he's, he's, he's just, I, I love my brother. I'm incredibly proud of my brother. But you know what else? He ain't God. I can tell you with absolute certainty that Billy Berger is not divine. And there is, as much as I love him, as proud as I am of him, there's no way on earth I'm calling him Lord. So what would have to happen to James and Jude? Because interestingly enough, the Gospels tell us that during Jesus' lifetime, they didn't believe in him at all. In fact, made fun of him. At one point, convinced their mother to go try to drag Jesus home by force because he was disgracing the family. He'd lost his mind. You can imagine how hurtful that had to be to Jesus. And yet, after he's dead and gone, they show up and say, we believe. And die martyrs' deaths. And if you, if you say to me, well, okay, that's just because now that Jesus was out of the way, they show up so they can take over the family business. Well, that only makes sense if the family business was a growing concern and was financially successful and led to prosperity. No, they came in at the worst possible time to be a Christian when there were just 120 people living uh, behind locked doors and no one believed what they believed made any sense at all. They were signing on for a life of hardship. And yet they came in and said, we believe, we've seen him. See, that's the only way I'm going to believe my brother's divine is if I see him risen from the dead and I touch him. And I know he's not a, a hallucination or my imagination. I, I've got to know. James and Jude knew. There's another question. These early Christians were all faithful Jews. Jews worshipped on Saturday. They had literally since creation. All of a sudden, this small group of Jews starts worshipping on Sunday. Now they keep on going to synagogue at first. They keep on praying in the temple daily, but they worshipped on Sunday. They called it the Lord's Day. You know, I know that we as Baptists don't like change, but the, the ancient Jews had us beat on that. They believed in their traditions. They would die for their traditions. There's no way they're going to start worshiping on another day other than Saturday unless something incredibly monumental happened. And consider this. So movement starts with 120 people in the upper room in Acts chapter 1. Within a generation They've turned the Middle East upside down. Within three centuries, here's Constantine, the emperor of Rome, saying Christianity is now the official religion of the Roman Empire. Which, by the way, if you know your history, didn't actually turn out to be a good thing for the church. We, we did better when we were persecuted than when we were legitimate. But still, it shows how quickly the movement spread. Which isn't proof by itself until you consider if you were going to start a religion in first century Rome and say, I want, to, I want to start a religion that really takes off, that people are going to love, you wouldn't have a religion that, number one, says, you know, sex is created by God as a picture of his love for his people. Therefore, it should be kept holy within the bonds of marriage alone. Well, the Romans didn't believe that. They hated that. You wouldn't create a religion that said the ultimate in godliness is to be humble and to serve others and to put others first. The Romans were all about social climbing and advancing, about ambition. There are so many things about Christianity that are just the opposite of Roman culture that if, if somebody shared those teachings with you in first century Rome, you'd say, why would I believe that? That's horrible. And yet it took over that part of the world. It spread so fast. How can you explain that? I'm not the only one that thinks that. Luke, Luke Timothy Johnson of Emory University, his quote is, some sort of powerful transformative experience is required to generate the sort of movement earliest Christianity was. And then N.T. Wright, one of my favorite authors, but he's a scholar from England. Um, that is why as a, as, a historian, as a historian, I cannot explain the rise of early Christianity unless Jesus rose again, leaving an empty tomb behind him. Because again, like we said last week, 
Christianity did not spread through military conquest. It did not spread through migration. It did not, did not spread because it became the dominant religion of a particular ethnicity and those people outbred all the other people. It spread through one-on-one contact, through individual people rubbing shoulders with people who didn't believe, and that's how it spread. And, and in order for someone who follows a faith that their family has followed since the beginning of time to change their mind all of a sudden, they've got to see something brand new. Resurrection happened. And then third, there's the testimony of, of hundreds of martyrs. So we've already talked about one of the theories that explains the resurrection is, well, it's just a legend, but we've shown that it happened too early for it to be a legend. So the other theory that people often bring up is, well, it's a conspiracy. The apostles made it up, which seems to hold water, right? Couldn't it, couldn't it be possible that that early movement of Christians got together and said, okay, let's, let's come up with, okay, Jesus is gone. Let's come up with a way to keep his teachings alive. Let's say he rose again. Well, let's, let's think about that possibility. Let's just do a little thought experiment, all right? Let's say that the people in this room, so there's probably, I don't know, 80, 81 people, all right? So 81 people in this room, which is fewer than the number who were in the upper room. It's about uh, two-thirds of that number. So let's say we decided there's no Christianity in this little thought experiment. Let's say here in 2019, we decide we're going to invent a religion. So we decide let's sneak into a graveyard and find the grave of someone we know who recently died. Let's dig that person up, hide their body, and then we'll tell everyone, hey, guess what? Larry rose from the dead, just as he said he would. I know y'all don't know Larry, but we've been following Larry for three years, and he's been saying all along, if you bury me, I'll, I'll come back. And look, the tomb is empty because Larry's alive. So, so come on and be Larryites like us. You know, Follow Larryism because it is the way to salvation. Now, how much success would we have? I mean, you and I are just shaking our heads saying, people today are so cynical and there's already so many religious beliefs, there's no way we'd convince anyone. Well, that was like ancient Rome. It was steeped in a particular religion, but there was also a, a cynicism toward religion itself. So, so it would be hard, but even if we're persuasive, people are going to think we're nuts. Your family is going to disown you. People are going to say, listen, if you keep talking about this Larry guy, you're not invited to the house for Thanksgiving. I'm not going to have anything to do with you if you keep talking about Larry. This is ridiculous. You're going to lose your job. Your friends are going to ostracize you. And then the cops are going to show up. And they're going to say, okay, so tell us about whose idea was it to dig up this body and where is this body now? Now, I believe that all of us are people of great courage, but I want to ask you, if, if all 81 of us are in separate cells and there are detectives grilling us and the detectives saying the same thing to every one of us, if you're the first one to tell us the truth, you're going to get a lighter sentence. How long is it before one of us says, okay, come on, this didn't happen. I, it, it, it was, you know, it was Merle's idea. You know, <laughs> just to put the blame on Merle, right? It wouldn't be an hour before one of us cracked. I'd crack. I'll just go out and say it. I'm not going to jail for a lie. These people didn't go to jail. They died. History records many of these people who testified of the resurrection of Jesus died martyrs' deaths. And, and I've had this discussion with non-believers before, and their response is often, well, that doesn't prove anything. Just because someone's willing to die for something doesn't mean they're right. After all, every day it seems there's someone who blows themselves up in the name of their God. And I'll say, aha, uh -huh. but the difference is the person who blows himself up in the name of his God has been told by someone he trusts that this is what God wants you to do. If you do this, you're going to receive some incredible reward. You're going to go straight to heaven. You're going to be eternally glad that you did what you did. Which, side note, always makes me wonder, why doesn't that person say, so, religious leader, why don't you blow yourself up if it's such a good idea? But that's, that's not my point. My point is, they're believing the testimony of someone they trust. You can't really blame them, in a sense, because they've been deceived. On the other hand, these early Christian martyrs, they weren't told 
that Christ was risen. They said, I have seen him risen. If I wouldn't go to jail for a lie, who would die for a lie? Who would die knowing that they're dying for something that isn't true? They're about to light the flames that are going to roast you alive. Aren't you going to say, oh, please stop. I will tell you where the body of Jesus is. I will tell you whose idea it was. I will tell you how we got him out of that tomb. And yet we know that nobody told that story. Because if even one had, the government would have publicized it. and Christianity would have been dead. Because again, Christianity wasn't a, a, a list of teachings, a list of rules, a list of rituals. It was the story of a human being who claimed to be God. And if even one person stepped up and said, he's still dead, it would have ended right then and there. So Wolfhart Pannenberg, great name, right? Uh, German theologian. The evidence for Jesus' resurrection is so strong that nobody would question it except for two things. First, it is a very unusual event. And second, if you believe that it happened, you have to change the way you live. So if you're listening to this and you're not ready yet to say Christ rose from the dead, ask yourself which of those two is your hang-up. If you say to me, well, I just can't believe in the resurrection of Jesus because nothing like it has ever happened before or since. It's just, I can't base my life on something I can't prove in a laboratory, something so unlikely, so unusual in human history. I get that. But then how do you explain all that we've talked about up till now? Consider that. Consider that there can be things that happen once in history. And that event once in history would explain, the eyewitnesses would explain the movement of early Christianity, would explain the fact that people who claimed to have seen it were willing to die. On the other hand, if you say to me, listen, I'm willing to accept that it's possible Jesus rose from the dead. I just don't want it to be true because if it's true, I have to change the way I live. Thank you for your honesty. But let me ask you to consider the possibility the possibility that maybe this thing that you fear is actually the best thing that could ever happen to you. Consider the possibility that this person, Jesus, and if you read about his life, if you listen to his teachings, if you study the kind of person he was, imagine if someone like that were actually king of the world. Someone that full of courage and grace and compassion. Someone that willing to right the wrongs that he sees. Someone that able to cure diseases. Imagine if that person ruled everything. Wouldn't you want that to be true? Wouldn't you want him to rule? I, I just want you to consider the possibility that following the risen Savior would be the best thing that ever happened in the history of your life. And for those of us who already know, and I assume that's the bulk of the people sitting in this room, our responsibility, I mean, you're not going to argue someone into believing the resurrection who doesn't want to. I'll just tell you, you can't prove it to them beyond a shadow of a doubt. Even if Jesus appeared in bodily form next to you, they wouldn't necessarily believe. So our job is to live in such a way around the people we know who aren't yet believers, and that means we have to actually spend time with people who aren't yet believers. We have to live around them in such a way that they see that we're not people who follow a religion. We're people who know a living Savior. And that is the life we're called to live. He lives, he lives, salvation to impart. You ask me how I know he lives, he lives within my heart. Great song. Why not live that way? That's our job. So let's pray. Lord Jesus, I love the chance to talk about and think about and read about your resurrection. First of all, because it's the grounding of the faith that has changed our lives, but secondly, because it's a foretaste of what's going to happen to us. And Lord, there are people in this room who've come face to face with death, people in this room who are grieving loved ones who died not so long ago. All of us, Lord, have touched, have been touched by that and have seen that happen and we've grieved. And to know, Lord, that it's not final, to know that death has no hold over us because of you is just such a joy. So Lord, help us to walk and live in such a way that people see that you are alive in us. And I pray, Lord, for anyone who hears this 
message who is not yet convinced that they would pursue you, that they would seek you and find you and know that you're alive. Lord, we pray these things according to your will, by the power of the risen Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.